I'm Virginia Phillips. I'm the Chief District Judge for the Central District of California. And it is my privilege to welcome all of you here today. The bench, the bar, members of the community. This program marks the 75th anniversary of the US Supreme Court decision in Fred Korematsu versus United States. My first uh, thank you goes out to the Ninth Judicial Circuit Historical Society, which has sponsored this program as part of a year-long series of events marking this anniversary, an endeavor to promote better understanding of the decision, which was a dark moment in our legal history and indeed in the history of our country's commitment to due process of law. So I would like to recognize Robin Lip Lipsky, who is the Executive Director of the Historical Society. <laughs> Robin has been the driving force behind all of these programs, and there have been many. I'd also like, of course, to acknowledge, and maybe in a, in a sense, We've already done this because we started two minutes late, which under Judge Carter would never have happened. <laughs> and I recognize that. Uh, but Judge Carter, of course, who could not be here today, um, who is also a driving force behind this program and having it here in Orange County. Uh, I'd like to express our gratitude to the Orange County chapter of the Federal Bar Association and the Orange County Bar Association you know, programs like this, as you can imagine, don't just happen without, it takes a village to put on a program. Uh, Terry Steele, who is the Deputy Clerk of Court for Orange County and her staff, who've done a wonderful job. Um, and Ann Shima, who, with the Catton firm in Los Angeles, who uh, provided the liaison with one of our um, wonderful speakers. So thank you to all of you. We have many, many dignitaries here with us today, and if I was to introduce each of you, that would take up the entire hour that Judge Carter allotted us. <laughs> so um, we're here really to listen to the wonderful speakers that we've lined up. So I'm not going to make individual uh, introductions, but I would ask all members of the bench, uh, federal and state, to stand up and be recognized, all judicial officers. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And um, now we are going to have the color guard advance. And after the flag is presented, Dwayne Roberts from the clerk's office is going to lead us in the national anthem, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led for us by Diego Gamacho, who is a student at the Santa Ana Legal Studies Academy. Color guard, advance. Please rise.
Doesn't that bring tears to your eyes? All right. And next we have Mr. Camacho. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for the routine and justice for all. The mission of the Ninth Judicial Circuit Historical Society is to preserve and educate us about the importance of, of our, to preserve and educate us about our history and to emphasize the importance of an independent judiciary. And the program we have today and the speakers that we are so fortunate to have with us will do um, a remarkable job, I am sure, in furthering the mission of the society. So first, it's my privilege to call on uh, the Honorable Kirk Nakamura, who's the Assistant Presiding Judge of the Orange County Superior Court. He, served on, he has served on the Superior Court since 2001, received his law degree from Duke University, and his Bachelor's of Science down the road at UC Irvine. He's a former president of the Orange County Japanese American Lawyers Association, the Orange County Asian American Bar Association, and he's been active in a host of legal organizations here in Orange County. Judge Nakamura. Thank you, Judge Phillips, for that nice introduction. It is an honor and a privilege to be invited here to speak on the 75th anniversary of Executive Order 9066 and the Korematsu case. As a Sansei or third generation Japanese American whose grandparents and parents were interned under 9066, I can speak of their reticence to talk about the internment. My mother, Roar Internment Number 2988D, was particularly bitter about spending her high school years behind barbed wire in Arkansas when she should have been at Lodi High. My father, Roar Number 2174C, found the conditions in the camp humane, but the internment was a financial disaster for his family. I am particularly honored to meet Judge Patel. She is perhaps one of the only judges or justices who unequivocally did right to the Japanese American community. Oh, you might say, but how about the dissenters in the Korematsu decision? Justices Roberts, Jackson, and Murphy. Didn't they do the right thing? We can applaud Justice Roberts for pointing out that the majority opinion authored by Justice Black erroneously, erroneously suggests that Fred Korematsu's conviction for failing to report to an assembly center did not necessarily mean he would have been interned at the relocation center. This simply was not supported by the record. But shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Justice Roberts was selected by the President to chair a commission, 
the Roberts Commission, if you will, on the causes of this disaster. The Roberts Commission report pointed to espionage not only by the Japanese American Embassy, but to, quote, others not associated with the embassy. This was erroneously interpreted by many, including the public, to mean that there was fifth column support by Japanese Americans. When the report was made public, it fanned the flames of prejudice against the Japanese American community. But what about Justice Jackson, who criticized the majority opinion as being a, quote, loaded weapon, unquote, for military abuse against American citizens? Justice Jackson, who, as you know, would later be the chief American prosecutor at the Nuremberg trials and prosecute military and political abuses, can be commended for this observation. But his record on Japanese American cases is mixed. During the internment, the state of California took or is cheated land held by non-citizen Japanese parents for the benefit of their children on the basis that this was a violation of the alien land laws prohibiting ownership of agricultural lands by aliens. In the case of Oyama versus California, the majority of justices held that this state action was discriminatory and improper, but Justice Jackson, who dissented, did not. Justice Jackson did not see that the alien land law was an improper and designed to prevent competition from the Japanese American community, as the majority opinion did. It is difficult to harshly criticize the last dissenting justice, Justice Murphy. After all, I think he correctly stated in his dissent that the majority decision fell into the ugly abyss of racism. But a year before he yielded to the pressure of the other justices and joined the unanimous decision in upholding the curfew violations of Gordon Hirabayashi and Minoru Yasui pursuant to Executive Order 9066. In 1987, oh, excuse me. So let's return to 1984. During her research into the Korematsu case, historian and attorney Peter Irons discovered that Solicitor General Charles Fahey had suppressed evidence and misled the Supreme Court in the initial Korematsu case. The military claims of necessity were supported by a final report by General DeWitt, which pointed to reports of shortage ship transmissions by subversive Japanese Americans on the U.S. West Coast. But these claims were contradicted by a Department of the Navy report and a report by the FCC in which it investigated hundreds of reports of radio transmissions which revealed no Japanese American espionage in contradiction to the final report. Moreover, a report from the Office of Naval Intelligence, the Ringel Report, concluded that a wholesale relocation of the West Coast Japanese Americans was not justified. Professor Iron's investigation revealed that the Justice Department's Korematsu briefs initially revealed these facts but were revised later to suppress them. And these newly discovered facts served as a basis for the writs of quorum nobis filed on behalf of the three Japanese Americans convicted for resisting the internment and the orders. You might say that in 1984, it should have been easy for Judge Patel to overrule this decision. After all, wasn't it generally recognized at that time that the decision was wrongfully decided? Wrong or not, Judge Patel was faced with U.S. Supreme Court presidents that she could not overrule. Moreover, the government was willing to set aside Fred Korematsu's conviction and argue that this mooted the writ. There would be no need to decide whether there was government misconduct that caused the Korematsu's conviction. This would, of course, have left the legal annals incomplete and the government's misconduct unexposed. Another judge, in hearing Yasui's writ of Coron Nobis, who heard this writ of application, did exactly what the Solicitor General's office requested and simply vacated Yasui's conviction and denied the writ of Coram Nobis. The judge refused to have a hearing on the claim of government misconduct. But Judge Patel heard the writ, and her opinion at 584 FSUP 1406 set the record straight and chronicled the story of Fred Korematsu, which was basically the story of all interned Japanese Americans from the date of his arrest to the hearing in 1984. The opinion referenced the report of the Commission on Wartime Relocation of Citizens. Established in 1980, this bipartisan commission was directed to review Executive Order 9066 and its impact on American citizens and permanent resident aliens. The nine-member federally appointed commission heard testimonies from over 750 witnesses, 
Its conclusions were submitted in a 1983 report entitled, quote, Personal Justice Denied, and recorded the fact that there was no documented act of Japanese American espionage during the war and concluded that the internment of Japanese Americans was a result of racial prejudice, wartime hysteria, and the lack of political leadership. Judge Patel's opinion also sadly documented attorney misconduct at the highest levels, which resulted in a Supreme Court opinion that ranks with Plessy versus Ferguson and Dred Scott as among the worst in US Supreme Court history. Ultimately, the exposed misconduct of the Office of the Solicitor General not only led Judge, led to Judge Patel's draining of the writ and a vacation of Fred Korematsu's conviction, but later, in 1987, to the passage of a bill granting $20,000 in reparations to the surviving intern internees of the evacuation, and in 2011, an unprecedented apology by the then acting Solicitor General, Neil Katyal, for his department's failures in the 1945 case. In the excellent film of Civil Wrongs and Rights, the Fred Korematsu story, there are some insights as to why the director believed the Supreme Court justices held as they did in 1945 in deferring to the military's judgment. But I cannot help but believe that the result in the case would have been different had Fahey been completely honest. Justice Douglas first voted in Chambers Conference to join the dissent but changed his vote later. He later said that he regretted this decision. Justice Rutledge, who wrote a concurring opinion in the Hirabayashi case, which expressed reservations about giving the military such deference, later in life said that these cases and one other death penalty case troubled him the most. These two justices could have easily changed their votes and have cleared Korematsu. The politics of the time did not compel a finding against Korematsu. President Roosevelt had been elected to his fourth term in office and the justices did not have to worry about their opinion affecting his reelection. The famed Japanese American 442nd Regimental Combat Team, the most decorated military unit in US history had just recently rescued 200 soldiers of the Texas Lost Battalion in the Bastias Mountains at a cost of at least 200 casualties, the most recent of their historic exploits. The war was about to be won. Ironically, Justice Black set forth a new strict scrutiny standard when examining laws which used race as a classification, even though most legal scholars observe it was not applied with much rigor when he examined the orders of his personal friend, General DeWitt. What a tremendous decision Korematsu could have been. It had, could have not only set forth this new strict standard scrutiny when dealing with racial classifications, but also it could have taken judicial notice of the low actions of the Japanese Americans as evidenced by the 442nd and also discredited 